Well, welcome everybody. My name is. Uh, okay, we are starting. Ready? Ready? Okay. Yes. We are ready. My name is uh, Mark Tomes. Uh, I am a uh, board member of the Niles Historical Society. Uh, this is uh, Dan. He is our museum curator at the Niles Historical Society. Hello. Hello. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a presentation today. Uh, no. And uh, we're going to be. Here. There we go. One of the things we're going to talk about is a little bit of Niles history, and then we're going to talk about the Golf Mill Shopping Mall and the uh, Mill Run Theater. I'm sure, you know, if you guys are familiar with Niles, Golf Mill is uh, the big shopping mall up, up at the uh, north end of the town. Uh, it is, um, its name, of course, is derived by the cross streets of Golf Road and Milwaukee Avenue. So, uh, Milwaukee for how long? Because there are many, many cars driving, and it's always okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the history of Milwaukee Avenue in just, okay. just a little bit. Um, I'm a, my, again, my name is Mark Tomes. I'm a uh, um, computer specialist for a major software company uh, based out of California. Uh, I uh, am an amateur genealogist, uh, amateur uh, photographer, and uh, love travel, and I love history. Um, it's a little bit of who, who I am. Uh, I'm a, I have a 32-year-old son uh, who uh, unfortunately has inherited my uh, bad pension for dad jokes. <laughs> So he has the same bad sense of humor as his father. Uh, my ties to Niles. Yeah, you know, I, to be honest, I've never lived in Niles. Uh, I have, uh, I grew up in Arlington Heights and have mainly lived in uh, Algonquin, Lincoln Hills, Arlington Heights, Schomburg, and Mount Prospect. But I have a deep, deep roots in Niles. Um, my father's, uh, mother and father's families, both were some of the founding families of Niles. Uh, they first were here in the uh, 1850s, 1860s. And one of the uh, interesting facts is my great grandfather uh, on my grandmother's side, uh, He, his farmhouse was actually right here where this nursing home is. Uh, it shared the same address uh, as, the, as this building. Uh, that's pretty, pretty close ties to you know, the, this location specifically and an Niles. And my great-great-grandfather, his farmhouse was just over where the factory was at the just recently got torn down. So, you know, his, uh, and uh, I went through it in the last uh, presentation. One of the things that was interesting is when they burned his uh, farmhouse down to make room for that factory, they actually burned it down, had uh, the firefighters doing a control burn, spraying a hose on it, and I had a four-piece jazz band playing in front of the burning building. You know, to entertain everybody that's there watching the house burn down. But uh, that's, um, and then my uh, grandfather's side of the family, uh, they lived just a little bit north and on the other side of the river from here, uh, between Hart's Road and here. And um, he, my great great, I'm sorry, my great grandfather was uh, part of the committee that was petitioned the state to form the village of Niles. And he also uh, was selected for the first city council as a, as a village trustee and served as a village trustee for 22 years, the first 22 years of the village. Um, and uh, you know, was reelected, I believe, 11 times uh, in 
until his pass. So, you know, both sides of the family have uh, deep roots, you know, as far as my father's family here in Niles. And that's my tie to the Niles. So. <laughs> you were asking about the uh, history of uh, Niles uh, and, and uh, Milwaukee Avenue. Most of you guys are familiar with Chicago streets, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Chicago streets are set up on a grid, you know, east, west, north, south. It's a square grid. <laughs> you can always tell, you know, where you're at. You're at, you know, 2300 south, 300 east, or 300 west. You can figure out where you're at. Well, there's exceptions to that grid rule. You know, Irving Park Road doesn't run straight east and west. Milwaukee Avenue doesn't run east or west, doesn't follow that grid pattern. Uh, and there's a few other ones. Um, Elston. I think I mentioned the Irving Park, Northwest Elston. Highway. Elston comes to Elston. Elston. Those are, you know, streets that don't follow that grid pattern. Have you ever wondered why those don't follow that grid pattern? reason why is because those streets were originally Indian trails and uh, they built the roads on the old Indian trails and so Milwaukee Avenue was originally a, an Indian trail that started out near Fort Dearborn heading northwest and eventually towards Wisconsin. I don't think it, it ever made it the Indian trail to Milwaukee but there were several Indian encampments along that way. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Irving Park, there was a huge Indian encampment where uh, um, Irving Park crosses the Chicago River. And uh, so that was, you know, a little bit of the history and why those streets and why Milwaukee runs the weird angle that it does. Um, so pre-1803, there was no settlements around here. Uh, it was just pure Indian settlements and, uh, and again, Indian trails. In 1803, the first uh, European settlers. Yeah, I don't see the picture. <laughs> uh, in 1803, the first European uh, settlers came uh, and established Fort Dearborn, which is uh, located, you know, in what is now downtown Chicago. On the um, uh, northwest side of the loop. So, in 1829, there was a, uh, after a bunch of battles and uh, different issues, the Treaty of uh, Pierre de Chine was uh, established, which set up reservations uh, and allowed the uh, European settlers to have more land for the city of Chicago. Well, one of those reservations, actually three of the reservations, were right here where this building is. Uh, it was an Indian reservation. Just north was another Indian reservation. And just south was another Indian reservation. The, the building is from somebody before? I'm sorry? That building is from somebody before? No, the, well, the Indian reservations were encampments. They were buildings. Yeah, right here. Um, and actually, one of my um, third great uncle actually bought the land that you know this property sits on from the Indians themselves. Uh, so it, again, it was originally the first European settlers here in this area, uh, which eventually became Niles, uh, was the Ebinger family, and. Um, they settled this area by pure hap uh, uh, hap you know, what chance. What happened is they were traveling from Michigan. They were heading towards Milwaukee. They got to this area, and their horse got bit by a snake, and the, and the horse died. So they said, well, let's settle here. <laughs> so they built a log cabin, and that's, that was the first family of Niles. 
and it's due to a snake bite on their horse. So, it's kind of interesting. That was 1833. 1834, the town of Chicago is organized. Population, 200. You can picture Chicago being only 200 people in 1834. So, 1837, the city is officially incorporated uh, as a city. And then 1849 is when Milwaukee Avenue first started to become paved, uh, which it originally was a plank road uh, because uh, when the people would travel on it, it was just a bunch of ruts, you know, from the wagon wheels and the horses and whatnot. And uh, to try to make uh, travel uh, easier, what they did is they took large timbers, set them up, set three of them along, and put planks between the uh, timbers. And that's what they would drive on, and that, hence the uh, phrase of a plank road. And then in the late 1850s, they started replacing those you planks know, because, you know, when you got planks on, a, on mud, yeah, the timbers on mud. Sometimes, you know, things would sink and become uneven and, and not much better than traveling on just the mud itself. And that's when they uh, uh, started replacing with, uh, with gravel road. 1871 was the Great Chicago Fire. And um, I'm sure you guys have all heard of that. There's a newspaper account that I've, I've come across where it talks about a, uh, a farmer in Niles, you know, with the great fire going on, the, a farmer in Niles came out at midnight, set up a chair in his uh, backyard, you know, with his back to the city of Chicago, and because of the light from the flames of the Chicago fire, he could read his newspaper at midnight. That's how bright the, uh, the Chicago fire was. And of course, people were fleeing from the, uh, the fire. One of the routes that a lot of people came was up Milwaukee Avenue and encountered the farmers of Niles. And many of the farmers you know, were there serving water, trying to share food and whatever they could to help the uh, people fleeing the fire. 1872, <coughs> um, Cemetery across the uh, road, St. Annabelle's, was established in 1872. And that started gen generating more and more traffic along Milwaukee Avenue as people would come from the city of Chicago uh, to visit St. Annabelle's, to bury people in St. Annabelle's. But one of the things that was um, rough is there, there's stories of uh, people trying to uh, make their way to St. Annabelle's. And uh, because of the road conditions, actually uh, having bodies and caskets pop out of the uh, wagon onto the road because of the, you know, the bad road conditions. One of the other things that uh, happened is things were different back then, obviously. They started putting up toll booths. You know, if I wanted to put a toll booth on, I bought the land on either side of the road and put a toll booth up and collected toll from you. If you wanted to go to St. Annabelle's, I charge you 25 cents or whatever. Well, 1889, the uh, last of the toll booths were destroyed. Uh, it was destroyed by a, a, a riot, a group of people that were upset at having to pay tolls. So they came along, destroyed, and burned down the toll booth, the last of the toll booths. Can't get away with that now. You still gotta pay tolls on the highways. So, uh, and then in 1899, the village of Niles was established. That was when uh, the village was uh, formed and uh, the uh, state charter was given, and uh, elected officials started serving for the village of Niles. So that's a little bit about the history of Niles and some of the history here. Next, you know, in order to talk about the Gulf Mill and the history of Gulf Mill, 
I'm going to probably ramble a little bit and talk about the, some of the types of malls there are. Um, everybody's familiar with strip malls, you know, uh, shopping strip uh, with you know stores facing a parking lot. Um, they, you know, usually based on uh, a function, and uh, a lot of them pop up after World War II. The other type was an indoor mall. Um, Golf Mill is currently an indoor mall. It's enclosed. There's anchor stores that uh, you can access from the outside, but to get to the majority of the stores, you have to go on the inside. Uh, Golf Mill, Woodfield are examples of in, in indoor mall. <coughs> Open air malls or outdoor malls. Um, shopping centers that with their that are limited to pedestrians, but they have open air shopping. Uh, Old Orchard uh, is an example of a, an outdoor open air mall. Uh, the Huntley Outlet Malls used to be. Uh, was an outdoor mall. You would park, you'd walk up and down and visit the stores, but you know, it was open air, you didn't have a roof over you. Downside of that is you know, traffic usually went down to, around the winter times uh, for those type of malls. Then closed street malls uh, or pedestrian malls, typically a street line with storefronts and close off the most traffic. An example of that uh, in Chicago is State Street Mall. You know, they, you can't drive a car up and down State Street, uh, and they have stores lining there. In 2009, there were at least 75 pedestrian malls in the United States. Here's a, a picture of Golf Mill Shopping Center. It was opened in 1960, and originally was an open-air mall. First anchor store was Sears. It also featured and still has a nine-story office tower designed by uh, architect Ido Belli that uh, looks like the top of a golf ball. It's got the dimples in the building. And uh, at the time it was opened in 1960, it featured a full mill theme complete with ponds, bridges, and actually a working mill or working waterway. The water wheel and the water feature that used to be at, uh, at Golf Mill. You can see this is the layout in 1961. Uh, everything was open. <coughs> this corridor here is open to the, uh, the weather. Um, everything else is accessible uh, from the exterior. And that's, that's how the mall was when it was open. 1961. Over the years, in 1986, the mall had major renovations and it was rebuilt as a closed mall, no longer being an open air. Uh, they added uh, J.C. Penney and a food court. And then in 2006, they remodeled again, adding a new food court en entrance and uh, they added a 12 screen movie theater. So this is kind of the layout in uh, 87, after the first one. You can see this that used to be open air is now enclosed. You have additional, there's your food court. And here's the uh, building that was with the golf ball, dimpled building there. And again, uh, it was closed off. So it no longer was an open air mall, it became a closed uh, mall. And again, the more remodeling with the uh, additions in the food court. Uh, major re re renovations. Uh, in 2002, they announced that they're going to redevelop most of the uh, mall, planning to demolish the former Sears, the AMC, the Circular Tower and various outlets to make a live work play style development. In other words, you're going back to the outdoor <laughs> mall. They're even talking about bringing back the water wheel that used to be there. Uh, 
and, and apartments. And this is kind of what they see as the layout for the future. You know, farm, it, there's nothing interior. Everything is in the exterior of the mall. And then uh, these are where they're going to put in, you know, apartments and everything. Uh, this is not currently existing, but that's what their plan is uh, for the future for it. And that's another artist's conception of what the future is going to look like for the mall. Now, uh, as part of the uh, Golf Mill Shopping Center, there was a Mill Run Theater, which we've got some exhibits here, uh, examples. This is a uh, uniform for an usher. Uh, here's the seating chart. Mill Run Theater was a theater in the round. You had the stage in the center and people sat all around it. Uh, very similar to uh, Marriott Lincoln Charter Theater. Uh, it's a theater in the round. We've got some hand bills uh, or play stage bills. Some of them autographed, including Zsa Zsa Gabor's autograph. Um, we've got some tickets and, and everything mm. else. So how much was that time? <laughs> the kids? Uh, tickets were running, uh, when they originally opened, like $7. Not that time. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Now one of the things, um, it was originally scheduled to open in June of 1965. But it was delayed until July because of rain. When rain, torrential rain is delayed the construction for a month, which is kind of, you know, some say it was jinxed from the beginning because of the, uh, uh, you know, the delays and everything. And Mill Run was originally a venue for off Broadway shows. It was supposed to be bring culture to the suburbs. Uh, they were going to have, uh, you know, original off-Broadway uh, shows. The first play that uh, opened the theater was A Man for All Seasons, starring Charlton Heston. You know, big name actor, and also a Chicago native. Chicago area native. Um, and the theater originally uh, seated 1,500 people. It was a pretty big theater. Didn't include that one. This is a, a picture of uh, um, or an ad in the Chicago Tribune featuring Charlton Heston uh, in the uh, A Man for All Seasons. You can see it coming in July, later June and July. Cesar Romero in a play. Um, all Broadway shows didn't last long. The uh, show ceased in January of 1969. Uh, the uh, theater owner bemoaned the fact that, you know, the suburbs just weren't ready for off-Broadway <laughs> at the time. And uh, that's why they, they uh, couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't do it. They were planning on uh, switching to musical comedies in, 19, uh, in April of 1969. But that closed in June of 1969 because the musical comedies never attracted any audiences. So you did musical comedies for about two months <laughs> and failed. Uh, in 1970, uh, the, the uh, original stage was turned into a revolving stage and uh, it opened as a um, performance venue. Uh, not plays, not, uh, you know, musicals, but uh, performers. Like the first person uh, opening it act was Shecky Green. I'm sure you guys remember Shecky Green as a great comedian. He's a funny guy. And that's a picture of the Bill Run Playhouse. You can see right here uh, the marquee Pia Zadora and the Letterman appearing. Some of the famous acts that uh, graced the Mill Run stage and, and Niles. Uh, Steve Allen, Woody Allen, Harry Como, Bill Cosby, uh, 
Tony Bennett, Jack Benny, Milton Burrow, Johnny Cash, Chicago's very own Bob Newhart, Wayne Newton, Mr. Las Vegas, graced the uh, Mill Run stage. Betty Davis, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Riley Dangerfield. And Debbie Reynolds, Don Rickles, Joan Rivers, uh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, Donna Summer, Ike and Tina Turner, Bob Hope, Tom Jones, Andy Williams, and Bobby Vinton. And there was just a touch of, you know, some of those uh, famous stars. There's even more here. We've got a stage bell from Liberace uh, performing at, uh, at Dolph Mill, or at the Mill Run Theater. It was shuttered for the 82 and 83 seasons due to uh, monetary issues. And they attempted a comeback uh, in 1984 with acts including uh, Gordon Lightfoot and B.B. King. But Golf Mill Shopping Center refused to renew the lease, wanted to expand into the area where the, the theater was. And it was finally shuttered in 1984 and torn <coughs> down also in 1984. Mm -hmm. And that beautiful, you know, theater here's, here it is being torn down. So that's my little presentation. Any questions you have? Well, yes, you sir. you mentioned the Native American connection with your family. Yeah. Do you have any of these official documents? For instance, you you bought the land from an Indian tribe. <clears throat> do you have any his, Do you have any documents? I that I don't. Um, one of my cousins has the actual, um, you know, Cook County tech, you know, real estate records, but I don't know if it goes back that, that far. Um, you know, like I said, and it was a, a third, third great uncle sold it to my great, great grandfather who it was his brother-in-law. Huh brother-in-law um, it's kind of ironic my, my great-great-grandfather was buying the land because he was retiring from being a Lutheran minister and wanted to take up farming and his two eldest sons which included my great-grandfather were going to be farming the land and they bought it from his brother-in-law who was selling everything because he wanted to become a Lutheran minister and was wanting to go to Seminary. It would be interesting to know what those amounts of money were for yeah. purchasing the land. Yeah. Well, um, there's not much of a Native American presence today in Niles. Um, do, you, do you think there's a reason for that? Is that there aren't very many Native Americans living here, or? Well, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, this is back in the um, 1840s, 1850s. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them were as with a lot of things that America did, they kept moving the Indians west. And so nobody remained here, and there's no real reason to come back here. No official plaques or anything that said no. that they lived here once. One of the, one of the <clears> things, <throat> I, I was tempted to, to try to talk to the uh, construction people next door to tell them to keep an eye out. Uh, but when this was farmland, you know, both here and next door, uh, one of my cousins uh, said that as they were plowing the, the fields, arrowheads would come up. Oh. And uh, so it would be interesting as they're doing construction to see if maybe any new arrowheads come up. But you said you're on the board of directors of the Niles, Village of Niles? No, the Niles Historical Society. Oh, Historical okay, because I was thinking, you think there'd be a marker or something uh, to show that they that they were here? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know how there's a, there's the Fort Dearborn stuff. Oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. You've seen the map. You you know what I'm talking about with the reservations. Yeah, Billy Caldwell. Yeah. Yeah, top of Yeah, there aren't very many places. Uh, I know Schiller Woods. You know, near Schiller Park, there's a. Uh, 
a lot of history has been done there and um, archaeology. A friend of mine that's an archaeologist has worked on that. So there's, not, there's a little bit in this area, but yeah, unfortunately, you know, people build up like next door, they're going to put a condo building there. Yeah. <laughs> so they don't. Who well, knows what could be in that dirt? I mean, there could be anything in the dirt. That, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, yeah. The instruction people that they keep a closer eye on it. Too bad they, they don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain to me the village of Niles? Um, is it considered a, su a commuter suburb of Chicago or is it considered a part of Chicago? No, it's everything that's uh, a suburb is not considered a part of Chicago. This village of Niles, correct me if I'm wrong, has its own government, uh, its own departments, mm -hmm. uh, its own standalone police and fire. You know, I mean, there's mutual aid, where, yeah. you know, and whatnot, but uh, it's an, enti an entire separate government entity from the city of mm -hmm. Chicago. They they share a border, but that's the, that's it. Well, one of the interesting things about Mill Run is that some of the earlier addresses he would put it had Chicago on it. And also, there's a golf course here called the Tam Golf Course. They did the same thing. They would put Chicago to get more people to come out. But then afterward, then they would change it to Niles. Oh. Yeah. Well, there, there, there's a lot of things like that that happen. Like um, Arlington and Toyota is actually in Buffalo Grove. But they think the name of Arlington Heights is more attractive than Buffalo Grove. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, same thing. You know, same thing. You know, uh, our city address may be, you know, maybe this, but this town has a better name. Uh, okay. And likewise, like Barrington. You know, you have Barrington. Right. Then you have Lake Barrington, South Barrington, Barrington Hills, <laughs> Barrington Shores. You know, uh, everybody wants to latch on to a, you know, a good name. It's all yeah. about location, location, and location, yeah. Yeah. and marketing. So. Yes, sir. Wasn't it Charlton Heston that played Moses in the movie yes. The Ten Commandments? Yes. Yep. They also, uh, uh, Beneath the, or the Planet of the Apes, uh, he was in that. Um, that was the first one, the first Planet yeah, of the Apes. Yeah. But he went, he went to a Northwestern uh, University uh, drama school. Yeah. Uh, one of his first, uh, I, I forget what it is, there's a, a temple, like a Shriners Temple or something like that, uh, on the north side of Lincoln Park, that that's where he filmed his first movie. Oh. It was a student movie when he was still a, a student. And, they were using it as a Roman uh, setting. So there's no real Shriner uh, uh, places around here, like in Chicago, you have old Shriner temples that are being turned into apartment buildings. And Well, you got Medina. Mm -hmm. uh, Medina's got a big temple. Uh, I mean, Medina itself is, you know, named for the Shriners. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed it. I want to thank you for your time and your attention. And, you know, again, I, I, you know, thank you. If you want to take a look at the, any of the artifacts, mm -hmm. uh, ask that Dan or I any questions. Mm -hmm. you know, we've got the, uh, again, the uniform for an usher. One of the interesting things, you all remember, what, what did an usher usually have back in those days? Flashlight. White gloves? Uh, flashlight. Oh, flashlights, yeah. yeah. He was going through this uh, uniform the other day and discovered a flashlight oh, wow. in the pocket. Oh, great. So, can't get more authentic than that. <laughs> oh, too bad, that, too bad the Mill Run Playhouse doesn't have a history book or something where all the stars put their names and everything. Well, the, the <laughs> amazing thing, uh, he's got quite a few of the stage bills mm -hmm. uh, that we were given. There's a lot of autographs on these. 
Yeah, and I'm not, I'll have to look into the research. I'm not sure if it was the woman that, her name was Alice Pabula. She was an usher there, and then she was also a you know, member and involved with the historical society. So I must have been her, I guess, that got the autographs. I'm, I'll have to look into it. Oh. Wasn't it uh, Andy Frame that used to have a lot of what? ushers? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they still do. Uh, they they do. still, I think, do security at like the Bears games and whatnot. This is kind of interesting. That that's from Sheppy. Oh, look at yeah, that! Yeah, it's a golf. It's a golf bag, or I mean, a golf mill bag, and you can oh, see the yeah. wheel. Oh the my thing. gosh! So that's an old one. There. That's an oldie but a goodie. <laughs> Bag on the back of it. Oh my gosh. Just in case you weren't sure if it was a bag or not. It's yeah, it was a bag. bag. Oh my gosh, is that fun? Oh golly. Yeah, I'd like to see the. Uh, I'd like to see the. Uh, um, oh yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, Liberace autograph. I don't think he actually autographed this particular one. At least, you know, we'd we have to open it up and take a look. That was a pretty nice jacket there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Tan Hunter. Betty Grable. Well, he would have been a thousand. He was the person that worked there. Oh, my so this is after it became a performance yeah. stage, you know, yeah. along with a lot of these other yeah. stuff. We have the band too, we just don't have I wonder if somebody would be in the dressing room. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, and we have they saw the value in it, but unfortunately, no, I don't think they couldn't get attendance. We couldn't fill it, so they weren't making money. Whereas today, they would be with all the, the pop stars and everything. And yeah. Yeah, the stars of the day, you know, like Dolly Parton performed. Yeah, yeah. Betty. Yeah. She wanted to go over. She's my favorite. Yeah. What's that? Wait. She wants to go upstairs? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 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 So this is, is this still maybe case 412? I think so. It's the, uh, the seating chart for the theater. Oh, big name. Oh, oh, big name. See, the stage was in the center. Big one, yeah. 1,500 so, people. Yeah. 1,500 people. Oh, my goodness. This is a ticket so, for uh, the last night. We were at the middle of the And have this piano, probably. Yeah, in the, in the middle the stage. Right in the middle. Piano. And it looked like there was no mm. bad seats, either. It looks like the oh, all, no. all pretty good seats. Yeah. Look at that. Down? Yeah, it <laughs> slowed down towards the, uh, the center. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And, and I, uh, I believe, I, as I mentioned, in 1970, they started uh, rotating the stage. 
So oh. even if you were sit, sitting there with a uh, Liberace's bank to you, yeah. eventually he'd be Very facing you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. I know I saw the uh, She was there too. She was there too. Lunch time. Yeah, that was sort of a sort of a scar 